All right, welcome to Beginning Digital Photography. And if you're interested in learning how to use your camera better or just learning how to use your camera, this is the place for you. So I'm a college professor, I teach photography. And the very first thing that we learn is the exposure triangle. And uh, yeah, it looks a little bit complicated in this video. We're gonna break it down so it's more simple and easy to understand. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the different aspects of the exposure triangle and what they do. Then we're gonna take a look at how to meter with your camera and then some just basic functions. And then I'll have some further videos where I go into more advanced metering and more advanced functions and just other features of the camera that you can use. So let's move on to the next slide. And this is the same thing, just in a different format. And what I've done here is broken everything down and putting little graphic boxes to help you understand it. And it's sized at 11 by 17, but you could print this out any size that you wanted. And it's gonna be available for download. So you just go to the website, you're gonna click on it, you're downloaded, bam, just for free, you'll have this. I also have a little card, and obviously you're not gonna carry this 11 by 17 sheet around with you. So I have something that's the size of a credit card, and that's another little kind of cheat sheet that shows you what the different aspects, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO are doing. So as you're out taking photos for the first year or six months, and you're having trouble remembering what things do, you could just peek at this, and it's gonna help you out. All right, so what we're gonna do is take a look at the first aspect of the exposure triangle. Now, the exposure triangle contains shutter speed, aperture, and ISO as I call it, or ISO. Either way you say it, doesn't make a difference. Same thing that we're talking about here. And each three of those functions controls the amount of light that gets into the camera, and we use that to get the correct exposure. We have to do that. Otherwise, we don't get a correct exposure and our image isn't gonna come out correctly. The secondary aspect is really the more important aspect of each one of those functions. And here in shutter speed, we're controlling motion. So do we wanna stop that fast action or do we wanna purposely blur part of our image? So we're controlling what's happening in the camera. Now, whether you wanna shoot in manual, semi-automatic, some of the preset modes, it doesn't matter. Understanding how to use the camera is the key to photography. Because just because you have the presets doesn't mean that the presets are always working correctly. Because you have to have your camera within working parameters a lot of times to get those results. And you'll understand as we move on what that means. All right, so the way these slides are set up is I'm gonna have obviously the title up here. A lot of times I'll have a little bit of basic information. I have some graphics, some information, and usually the numbers, and the numbers are usually the confusing part for people learning photography. Until they get the numbers, you're gonna struggle, all right? Now we look at the numbering system and what we call whole stops. So this is whole stops, 30, 60, 125, 250, 500. On your camera, you will notice in between 250 and 500, there's two more numbers, all right? Those are third of stops. When they made digital cameras, they realized they needed the, that third of stop instead of a half a stop because they were just more sensitive. Cameras move in third stops, but we learn in whole stops just to simplify the process. In shutter speed, and shutter speed is very simple, there's a mechanical shutter, it opens and it closes. So if it stays open for a long time, it lets a lot of light in. If it stays open for a short period of time, it lets a little bit of light in, all right? The faster your shutter speed, the faster you can stop action. So the first thing that we have here is bulb, and sometimes bulb is on the numerical LCD or you have to set it to bulb. But what that means is if you press and hold the shutter down, the shutter stays open. And when you release the shutter, the shutter closes. That's it, all right? So here we have 30 and usually 30 seconds is about as long as you can get a shutter to stay open on a digital camera. 15, 10 seconds, five, one second, a quarter of a second, one one thirtieth of a second, one one sixtieth of a second, and so on. And cameras can usually go up to one four thousandths, up to maybe one eight thousandth of a second. It's the fastest shutter speed that you're gonna see. Now, the important numbers that we need to look at 
are two and one's kind of a variable. So we're gonna take a look at 60th right here first. And what this number is, and remember this is a minimum, and it's a minimum for if you're hand holding your camera in your hands and you're taking a picture of a non-moving subject, the slowest, let's go over this again, the slowest you can shoot is about a 60th of a second. Now, if you can shoot at a 125th of a second, that's gonna be better, because even in the 60th, sometimes people move or you move, and you might get a little bit of motion blur in that image, which will ruin it. So we don't want to shoot at the minimums. Now, there's another way to think about this, and I have this down here. Some people, and I think this is a better one, say that the minimum you should shoot of a non-moving subject and held is equal to your focal length, all right? So your camera lens is measured in millimeters, and those millimeters are what we call focal length. So if it's an 18 to 55, which is the basic kit lens on most cameras, your camera has a focal length of 18 to 55. So if you're at 55, the slowest or minimum shutter speed you wanna use for a handheld image would be 1 55th of a second. Now, where that comes into more important, if you have a 70 to 200 and you're at 200, then instead of 1 60th being the slowest shutter speed, you need to move up here because at 200, you need to at least be at a 200th of a second. And remember, always moving higher if you can is always gonna be a good idea because that's going to ensure that your image is going to be sharp. The next thing that we have highlighted is 1 1,000th of a second. And the reason for that is, uh, that's the minimum shutter speed that I say you should shoot at to stop action. Typically, it used to be 500th of a second. Yeah, that will stop like someone walking. But if you're trying to stop action, 500th of a second really isn't going to do it. I would say the slowest is 1 1,000th and 1 2,000th is going to be much better. So you can see right here, stop action, those numbers. Handheld, these numbers. If you want to blur or you need to use a tripod, numbers, all right? So the way this works is you can see up here, I've got some little icons and the icons are here to help you. So if we look here, handheld, if you want your image to be sharp and it's more like a portrait where the subject isn't moving, these are the numbers that you need. If you shoot down here, as you get slower and slower, you're going to increase or add more blur to your image. Now, how that blur appears in your camera is gonna be different. So if you're hand holding your image, and you shoot at 10 seconds, yeah, it's really gonna be blurry. Everything's gonna blur. But if you were using a tripod and you shot for 10 seconds and you were shooting the landscape of a city, things really aren't gonna blur that much. Maybe if there was a river running through it, the water might blur or some trees might blur, but the buildings aren't gonna move. So even at 10 seconds and you're using a tripod, nothing's gonna blur in that image. All right, so this is shutter speed. So what we need to know in shutter speeds, it's controlling light and it's doing that for how long that mechanical shutter opens and closes, and it also controls motion. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of shutter speed. So if we come to this image, we see that we have this woman running. Now the woman running is blurred. However, the background isn't blurred. So we know one of two things. It's either a really slow shutter speed and they're using a tripod or it's handheld but fast enough to stop movement of a non-moving subject which is the building but not the subject so my guess is this image was probably taken around 1 60th or 1 25th of a second and just because this person is blurred doesn't mean that it's a bad image maybe we're trying to show that aspect of time or motion in our photo so we wanted the person to blur so here we have an image that is definitely used with a tripod. Well, how do I know that? Well, because the background on the sides in the sky isn't moving, okay? And that indicates that we have a long exposure. So a long three to five second shutter speed might be something like that we would use at night. Now, because the cars are moving, they're creating what we call light trails. We're using these light trails to draw us through the image. So this would be a tripod using a long shutter speed and having the outsides be still because they don't move and getting the motion of the light trails of the car. So this example is stop action. And so this 
image would have to be shot over one one thousandth of a second. And I would say it's even faster than that because a lot of times, even the thousandth, you might still see the wheels turning unless they put the brakes on on purpose to keep the bike stable in the air. So this is an example of stopping action. You want to use a thousandth of a second or faster. I would say 2000 if you can get that. Here's another one. Our next image is of a swimmer. And you would think that, well, swimmers don't move that fast. Do I really need a fast shutter speed to stop that action? Yes, it's the water droplets. As the arms come out, that movement is extremely fast. And if you don't have a super fast shutter speed, it will actually blur. Now you can use that blur as an aspect of controlling the image. So if you remembered, I said the presets, well, yeah, you can get it to stop action. Do you want it to stop action so fast that the water droplets are little water droplets? Or do you want those water droplets to maybe blur, but you stop the subject? That's part of those variables in photography that a camera does not understand. The next aspect of the exposure triangle is something that we call aperture. And aperture is probably the one that gets most confused by beginning photographers. And that's definitely because of the numbers. So the numbers down here are written in what we call f-stops, all right? We call it aperture. The numbers are in f-stops. And it's referring to like an iris or a diaphragm that opens and closes. So a low f-stop, 1.8, is letting a lot of light in, all right? It's open. A small f-stop where the little opening is tiny is letting a little bit of light in. And just like in shutter speed, we see whole stops here. So f1.8, 2.8, f4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32. Usually you don't see past 22. Um, some cameras have 32. There are numbers below 1.8. Those are really expensive pro lenses. So we're just going to not think about it that at this time. So just like we did in shutter speed, one aspect of aperture is it's controlling the amount of light. So obviously when the lens or iris is open a lot, it's going to let more light in and let less light in. It's secondary function that we see down here, and DOF stands for depth of field, is how much in focus do we see the background generally. So what this means is the field is, if we focus on this subject here, they're the field. So what appears in focus in front of and behind them, that's the depth of the field. So a shallow depth of field, as we can see in this image, yeah, we're not gonna see those mountains that are behind the subject. So when you're shooting at f1.8, it lets a lot of light in, as we can see down here, and it has a shallow depth of field. And as we move up, f16 lets uh, a little bit of light in, but it has a wide depth of field, meaning everything might be in focus. Just like before, you can control how much of that depth of field that you want. Do you want uh, none of it, a little bit of it, or a lot of it to be in focus? So that's what we're doing with aperture, okay? Depth of field is controlled by aperture, but it actually also has, as we can see down here, two other elements. So depth of field is controlled by aperture, but it's also controlled by focal length and distance to subject. And we'll get into that in another video. Right now, I just want you to focus on the exposure triangle. When it comes to aperture, we have two different types of lenses. Most of your basic lenses are gonna be this kind. They're gonna be variable aperture lenses. Most of your pro or intermediate lenses will be fixed lenses. And what that means is first, we need to understand what's going on in the front of our camera. So we're gonna have up here where that lens is made, most likely not in Paraguay, all right? Right here is the filter thread on the outside of the camera or lens cap side, and that's written in millimeters. So this is a 77 millimeter. It's saying that this is a zoom lens. That's a 17 to 35 millimeter zoom. That's our focal length. And right here is our aperture. In this case, it's fixed, meaning if you're shooting at 17 or 35, it's always 2.8, all right? You're gonna pay more money for that, and it's way easier to deal with. Over here, however, everything's exactly the same except for our aperture. 
notice there's a four to five, six. So what that means is at 17 millimeters, you're at F4. That's as much light as you can let in. That's a low aperture. But as you zoom out the 35, it's going to consistently change. So it might go four, then to 4.5, then to five, then to 5.6 at 35 millimeters, all right? As you zoom, your exposure is gonna change. And that's difficult to remember because usually you take a look at your camera, you set up your settings, you get your exposure. And then if you zoom to take your picture, it might change your exposure a little bit, all right? So that's something that you need to keep in mind as you zoom with a variable aperture lens, you might need to change your exposure. With a fixed lens, you don't have to think about that because it's always exactly the same. So let's take a look at aperture, all right? So here's a portrait of a subject, and this is a shallow depth of field, all right? Um, this might not even be 2.8. This could be 1.8, because if you notice, this eye is out of focus, and this is in focus. This is an extremely shallow depth of field, and it works really well for doing portraiture. So you wanna throw that background out, you shoot with a low aperture, and that's gonna give you a shallow depth of field. So if you want a medium aperture, so we're taking this wedding photo, and you'll notice all in focus to about here, and then it kind of slowly fades out. Now, it's not totally out of focus, but it's kind of out of focus. So we know this is maybe a 5.6 or an f8, somewhere around there, it's a medium aperture to get that effect. Our last image you can see just about from here all the way back, just everything is in focus except for this. It's a little out of focus up here, but this would be a good example of using a high f-stop or high f-stop number, f16, f22, where everything is gonna be in focus. So our last aspect of the exposure triangle is ISO as I call it, or ISO as it's correctly called, and that is controlling what we used to call film speed. So since, so since we don't have film speed, it's really more about the sensor. And if you think of the sensor as volume knob on a stereo, all right? So if you're playing the music and it's soft, you're using just a little bit of gain, okay? And as you turn that volume knob off, you're actually just increasing the gain. And as you increase that gain, you get more of that static and noise in an image at a certain point. And that's kind of what's happening here. So we have our sensor. And at a 100 speed film, that sensor is the least sensitive to light, meaning we need more sunlight or light to make an exposure. It has less gain. As we move up to 12,800, we've increased the sensitivity of that sensor. So we don't need a lot of light. So you could take pictures indoors when there's not a lot of light. However, because that gain has been increased, it's creating noise in the image. Now, is it creating this much? Probably not, but that's a good illustration as to what's going on. ISO, it's controlling the amount of light in the camera and it's doing that by the sensitivity of the sensor which i know is a little bit confusing when you think about it and the secondary aspect is image quality so the two things that are going to happen is yes you're going to get noise but you're also going to going to have sort of a compressed tonal range and so you're not going to have like a bunch of steps between white and black you're going to have a smaller um, tonal range than you would when you shoot at ISO 100. So um, one important thing I think that is most helpful for people, and we'll see this and we might even need to come back to it when we do metering is the first thing that I set up when I go to take photos is where am I taking the photos? So if I'm outside and it's daylight, I'm usually gonna set my camera, I usually use 200, but you could use 100 or 200. If it's cloudy or shade, maybe I need to do 400 or 800. And if we're in low light conditions, maybe one of these numbers, depending on how dark it is. So that's a good basis of where to set that ISO so that then you can shut your shutter speed and aperture because really shutter speed and aperture are much more important than your ISO. This is a great guideline and this is on the little basic cheat sheets that I have as well, where you should kind of start to set it out. Now, the reason there's usually multiple numbers is, well, 
Cloudy would be good if your subject is not moving, but maybe if you're shooting action, because you're gonna have to have a faster shutter speed, you might need to have a little more sensitive ISO to compensate for that. All right, so let's take a look at two examples of ISO. So on your lower ISOs, um, you're not gonna have that noise in that you see in the image. And really, you don't really start seeing noise in today's cameras until you really start getting around 6400 ISO or higher, especially excessive noise. But basically you're gonna have a clean image in a long tonal range at a low ISO. But if you shoot at night, you can see here, and, and this is excessive, you would not see this much noise in most cameras unless you are really, really high, not even 6400. Now the older cameras, you would see this much noise around an ISO or ISO of 800. But as you increase that, you're increasing that noise in the camera. The next aspect we're gonna take a look at is then how to meter. So we've learned about the exposure triangle and how do we get the correct exposure to take a photo? So if you look on the LCD on the back of your camera or through the viewfinder, you're gonna see a set of numbers like this, all right? And so we have zero and zero is what the camera assumes is the perfect exposure. Then we have minus one, minus two, these little third TIG marks right here, or if our minus one third, minus two thirds, just like that in both directions, all right? If you're on the minus side, your image is going to be too dark. So if you had uh, the little tick mark here and the tick mark moves as you adjust the shutter speed, ISO and aperture of your camera, if you set it up and it's at minus one and you were to take a picture, it would be too dark come over here and you had it at plus one, it's gonna to be too bright. And if you get it at zero, it's gonna think it's gonna be the perfect exposure. However, there's a trick. The camera meters in average in its default mode of 18% gray. And if you have a lot of black in your image, it's accidentally gonna tell you the wrong exposure and it's gonna make that exposure too bright. And if you have a lot of white, it's gonna make it too dark. So sometimes you do have to compensate and we'll take a look at that in a second. Now we do have different metering modes that we'll take a look at in a later video because you can do spot meter, center metering, average metering. So what you wanna do to meter is, if you're at minus one, obviously you're gonna need to let more light into the camera, so one stop more light. And you can do this by using ISO, aperture, or shutter speed. And at this point, you're most likely gonna be using either the aperture or the shutter because you've set your ISO. So you're gonna adjust that aperture or shutter speed, but you need to pay attention to what you're doing because if you're at a 60th of a second and you wanna let more light in, you're gonna go down to a 30th of a second. And if we remember at a 30th of a second, that could start to blur our image. So we have to pay attention when we move it and not just move it. So what you're trying to do is get that little tick mark on the zero. Now, if you don't see the tick mark anywhere, that means your exposure is so far off, it's not within plus or minus two yet. So you're gonna have to make some more drastic changes to get that within working parameters. And when I mean working parameters, this is what I'm talking about, close to where you need to go. All cameras have what we call different metering modes. Now. I only have the Canon and Nikon up here, but basically, whether you're a Sony shooter, Pentax, Olympus, everybody's basically gonna have something similar. Just look in your manual to see what the different icons are, but the process is basically the same. So up here, we have Nikon down this side and Canon on this side. And our first thing here is what Nikon calls matrix metering and Canon calls evaluative metering. Now, basically, this is just a 60-40 average. It's 60% weighted in the center and 40% on the outside. That's essentially what it is. Now, back in the film days, I used to change these metering modes all the time because they were super helpful depending on what you were photographing. However, it's not really worth my time to change the metering modes because I can just look on the back of the camera. And at this point in my life, I have a pretty good idea if the camera is gonna over or underexpose something and I need it. Now. These metering modes can be helpful if you just have like a highlight on someone's face, or if we take a look in the next image, I have a picture of the moon. So um, in the average meter, it's going to overexpose those images a little bit. 
And with using a spot or a center weighted, I might be able to get a more accurate meter from the camera. So our next option is center weighted metering. So it's just relying on the center portion of the image. And that's the only area that's metering. It's not metering anywhere else out here. Our last is spot metering. And this is great if you have like what I just said, a highlight that you need to meter off of. So you would just set that spot. It's like a two or three degree spot. And you put that dot right on the area where you want to meter. And it's going to be more accurate than it would if you use the evaluative metering. So those are your different metering modes. Feel free to try them out and see how you like them. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you like. As long as you use it and it comes out and works correct, that's what we're looking for. So let's take a look at metering and what an image will look like. So this is an example of a properly exposed image. And when I'm doing that, I'm actually exposing for my highlight values. So I tend to shoot on the dark side, a little bit dark, because it's easy for me to open up my shadows. But I've learned in photography, if you overexpose your highlights, it's really easy to lose detail. This is an example of one stop underexposed. So it's one stop too dark. And you can see it's okay, it's still usable. And this is one stop overexposed. And where the dark was still usable, sometimes an overexposed won't be usable. Yes, if you're shooting raw, you can adjust your exposure and maybe save this highlight. So what happens is if you lose your highlight detail when you darken it, it will just fill it in gray and it looks really bad. It's basically unusable at that point. So you need to get accurate exposures. Do not rely on shooting raw, even if you're using raw at this point. We want you to get accurate exposures. They're always gonna give you a better image. Before I talked about black and white and the way the a meter works. So if this was the correct exposure, all right, and we metered this, the camera would actually probably meter it more like this. This is a little bit exaggerated, but close to this. It's gonna make it darker because it's looking for an average of 18% gray and this might be 5% gray. So it's gonna make your whole image a little bit dark. So in that case, you need to uh, not rely on the meter and actually overexpose your image a little bit. In this second case, if you have a lot of black in your image, your camera is going to tend to overexpose your image. So you can see this is our correct exposure. Everything's really dark. However, your camera is going to overexpose and you're gonna lose all that highlight detail. So in this case, you would purposely need to underexpose a little bit. Cameras actually have auto exposure compensation. It's just a little dial that you can set to tell it to automatically over or underexpose if you're shooting in automatic or semi-automatic modes. So at this point, I think the best thing we can do is stop. At this point, we don't wanna give you too much information that everything kind of slurs or bleeds together and you don't remember anything. So go ahead, pick up your camera, play around with it. Learn how to adjust your shutter, your aperture, and your ISO so you're comfortable with it. Canon and Nikon dials move in the opposite direction. So make sure that you're moving it in the right direction, what goes up, what goes down, that you understand that. And take a look at your meter so you can practice trying to go outside and get your meter to accurately expose something. Don't be happy with just getting it once and then shooting all day long constantly try to readjust it so you get used to it. That's what's gonna really benefit you in the long term. So when we come back, we're gonna look at some basic camera functions and other items. If you found this video helpful and could give us a thumbs up, that would be great. If you have any comments or questions, you can always leave those below and don't forget to subscribe.